Thank you.
evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I just want to welcome everybody tonight. Um, if you can uh, find some seats, you know it's a little bit uh, tight seating tonight. Uh, we've got a great crowd, great discussion. Um, if you need to run to the restroom or grab another glass of wine, please do, them, uh, do so now. We will probably start the program in about five minutes. Oh, and for the question and answer uh, session, we have a microphone over here to my left uh, and one in the center. Uh, if you want to just kind of line up, give folks in space, uh, keep your questions short uh, so that everybody gets a chance to ask a question. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? No. It can't hear me. <laughs> oh, do this. Ah, there we go. Okay. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm not used to it. Okay. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, and thank you so much for coming out uh, to UMKC, to the campus this evening, uh, for this evening's program, The New Cold War, presented by Dr. John Mersheimer. The Cockafair Advisory Committee was so pleased uh, that Dr. Mersheimer accepted our invitation to speak tonight. 
My name is Pam Hosel, and I'm a member of the Cock Affair Advisory Committee. Uh, we've just had a terrific turnout, as you can see here in the audience tonight. We had over 400 reservations for tonight, with about 125 people streaming. So, hello to you out there in Zoom land as well. Um, in our audience tonight are members of the Mid-America Cornell University Alumni Organization who have come here tonight to hear their distinguished alum, Dr. Mersheimer. So I just want to extend a, a special welcome to our guests from the Mid-America Cornell Association, and we hope you'll come back for future Cock Affair programs. We want to thank Cock Affair's good friend, Steve Kraske of KCUR-FM, for the interview with Dr. Mersheimer that aired earlier this week. How many of you did hear that program? Just curious. Okay. And of course, you can still uh, access that program on KCUR. Um, just a few announcements related to Cock Affair upcoming programs. Uh, the evening of April 16th, the Cock Affair Advisory Committee and the Rider in Residence program will host Buki Papillon. Uh, she is a poet, and she will read from her works at the Kansas City Public Library. And then on May 3rd, um, we will welcome Andrea Wolf, noted author and historian. You may be familiar with her books on uh, nature, on Alexander von Humboldt, and her recent book, Magnificent Rebels, is, is out and available. So we hope to see you back for that. Um, very special program as well. Um, as most of you are also aware, Cock Affair presents continuing education classes, and this is the brochure that will tell you what we're teaching, offering for the spring semester, starting on March 9th. So I won't detail that out for you, because you can just uh, access it yourself, and complete registration information is on our website. I want to take just a moment to remember two longtime members of the Cock Affair Advisory Committee who recently passed, and the, that is Al Morrow and Mary Ellen Young. We will miss their presence and their valued advice. Um, and now it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Dr. Rebecca Best back to the Cock Affair podium. Dr. Best will introduce Dr. Mearsheimer. Dr. Best joined the Political Science Department at UMKC in 2012. Her current research focuses on the integration of female combatants, the effects of women in government on the prospects for peace resolutions of civil wars, and the effect of insurgent fractionalization on bargaining between states and rebels, and the effects of terror Tara watch list. That's a lot. <laughs> so please, please welcome Dr. Rebecca West to the to the podium. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, and good evening. A conventional war between Russia and Ukraine would entail vast military casualties and the possible murder of many thousands of civilians. We might expect that this prescient observation was made just a year ago, but in fact, Professor John J. Mearsheimer warned of the potential for and devastation of a war between Russia and Ukraine in 1993. This evening, I have the honor of introducing to you one of the most influential political scientists of the past 20 years. That's not just the typical hyperbole you hear in these sorts of introductions, that's from the results of a 2017 poll of international relations faculty. Professor Mearsheimer is the author of six books, including The Tragedy of Great Power Politics and numerous articles. He earned his bachelor's degree from West Point in 1970 and his PhD in 1980 from Cornell University. He is the R. Wendell Harrison Distinguished Service Professor of Political Science at the University of Chicago. Over the past year, Professor Mearsheimer has made headlines arguing in multiple forums that Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine is attributable to the United States. As his earlier quote suggests, the idea of a war between Russia and Ukraine is one that has long troubled him. 
Though recent events have brought more media attention to his claim of U.S. responsibility in the war, it is, in fact, one that Professor Mearsheimer has been making for some time. Also in 1993, he argued, quote, extending NATO's security umbrella into the heart of the old Soviet Union is not wise. It is sure to enrage the Russians and cause them to act belligerently. Professor Mearsheimer is best known for his theory of offensive realism, which guides his controversial and much debated claim that Russia's invasion of Ukraine is the consequence of U.S. policy. Two key points of offensive realism may help us to understand Professor Mearsheimer's analysis. The first is that international institutions like NATO and the European Union have, quote, minimal influence on state behavior. By this logic, NATO is viewed as little other than a tool of U.S. influence. The second key point is that the nature of the international system forces states to be expansionist, meaning that all states are inherently unhappy with the status quo and seeking to expand their own power and influence. Professor Mearsheimer has argued that the appeal that NATO, Western-style democracy and integration with Europe hold for Ukraine is a natural threat to Russia. In other words, NATO is part of the United States' effort to expand its own influence. Or at least that is how Putin interprets NATO. And therefore, the invasion of Ukraine is the aggressive action that offensive realism dictates a rational Russian leader would take to be the most powerful state in the nation. For 30 years, Professor Mearsheimer has warned of the war that we see today. Now, before I hand things over to him, to give his analysis of that war and U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia and China, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the little-known connection between one of his mentors, Hans Morgenthau, the father of realist theory and international relations, and the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Here's Professor Mearsheimer. Hmm. Hmm. I don't actually see <laughs> oh, is he? Oh, there he is. Ah, yes. <laughs> uh, Professor Mearsheimer, I don't know if you were aware of this when you accepted the invitation to speak here this evening, but Professor Morgenthau joined the faculty of this university, which was then called the University of Kansas City, in 1939 uh, before moving to the University of Chicago. So I few copies of some university news articles from his time here uh, that I'll, I'll give you. But ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor John J. Mearsheimer. <clears throat> After the talk, if you'll hold your questions uh, for the end, Professor Mearsheimer will take questions and there are some microphones set up. I'm actually going to speak with, okay. give this to Matt. Thanks. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Rebecca. Uh, I had no idea that this was the school in Kansas City that Morgenthau had initially taught at. I knew he taught at the University of Kansas City, but every time I Googled the University of Kansas City, it wasn't there. So I figured <laughs> it just disappeared. Uh, but... Uh, it makes it an even uh, more special honor to be here, knowing that Morgenthau once uh, roamed these halls, uh, although surely in a different building. Uh, <laughs> I greatly appreciate uh, being invited to speak here tonight. Uh, it's wonderful to be back in Kansas City. I've been here before, uh, and I greatly appreciate the fact that all of you, uh, are you having trouble hearing me in the back? Oh, really? Okay, hang on. Can you hear me now? Is it better? No. How about if I just talk a little bit louder like this? Is that better? Okay. I will do my best to speak loudly. And again, if people can't hear me in the... Rear, just raise your hand and I'll do my best to increase the volume of my voice. Uh, as I said, it's a great pleasure to be here and I'm thrilled that you all came out to hear me tonight. 
Uh, and I'm very anxious to hear your response to my talk. So I look forward to the Q&A. Uh, the subject that you know I'm talking about tonight is the new Cold War. And what I want to do is I want to talk about the causes of the new Cold War. And I also want to talk about what it looks like, describe its various dimensions. So that's my goal. And I'm going to make the basic argument here that the new Cold War is more dangerous than the old Cold War, the Cold War that took place between 1947 and 1989, a Cold War that many of the people in the audience remember well. I think this new Cold War is more dangerous, and I think it's going to get even more dangerous with the passage of time. We live in perilous times. Now, my talk comes in three parts. First of all, I want to talk about the basic structure of the international system today and explain to you how the structure of the system basically uh, forces the different actors to behave in particular way. The structure structures the competition, okay? So I want to talk about the structure of the system. Then I want to drop down and talk about the war in Ukraine, and I want to focus on the Russia-U.S. competition. Then I want to drop to another level and talk about the U.S.-China competition. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the structure of the system, talk about the U.S.-Russia competition, and then talk about the U.S.-China competition, and then tie all three of those things together in the conclusion. Now, with regard to the structure of the system, my basic argument is that what you want to understand is that most of us were born into a bipolar world where there were two great powers on the planet, the United States and the Soviet Union. And when the Cold War ended in 1989, and certainly when the Soviet Union broke apart in December of 1991, we went from a bipolar world where there were two great powers to a unipolar world where there was only one great power. Then roughly around 2017, the unipolar world came to an end and we moved into a multipolar world. The multipolar world that we live in now has three great powers in it, the United States, China and Russia. The United States is by far the most powerful state on the planet in that multipolar world. The Chinese, however, are catching up to the United States. And most people today, me included, refer to the Chinese as a peer competitor to the Americans. So China is a peer competitor to the United States. Russia is the weakest of the three great powers. But we're in a multipolar world now. The world that you lived in between roughly 1990 and 2017 was a unipolar world. And in a unipolar world, by definition, there's only one great power. So you cannot have great power competition. You cannot have great power war because there's only one great power. In the Cold War that we grew up in, many of us that is in the audience, in that Cold War world, there were two great powers. And as you all remember, we had an intense security competition between the United States and the Soviet Union. And fortunately, we never had a hot war between them. But we did have this one conflict dyad between great powers during the Cold War. Then we went to the unipolar moment where there was no great power politics because there was only one great power. And we have now moved into a world where there are three great powers. And once you move from unipolarity to multipolarity, great power politics, security competition is back on the table. And that's what's happened since roughly 2017. Great power politics is back. Now, Let's talk a little bit about China, Russia, and the United States. My belief 
in recent years was that what would happen here is that you would have an intense security competition between the United States and China. And Russia would be our ally. It would be the Russians and the Americans against the Chinese. The Russians and the Chinese have historically been adversaries, and Russia is in no way a threat to the United States. And therefore, it seemed to me that it made eminently good sense to have the Russians on our side. If you have three great powers in the system, and you're one of them, and one of those other great powers is a serious competitor, you want to make sure that the third great power is on your side. If you go to war against Adolf Hitler in World War II, you want to go to war with the Soviet Union against Adolf Hitler. You don't want to fight Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin at the same time. But what's happened here is we have ended up in a situation where we basically have an intense and bitter rivalry with both Russia and China. It didn't work out the way I anticipated it. It's not the United States and Russia against China. It's the United States versus Russia and the United States versus China. We are in two dangerous conflict situations in Eastern Europe and in East Asia. And there's no sign that we're getting out of either one of them. There's no sign that we're going to jump into bed over time with the Russians and be allied with them against the Chinese. So this is the basic world that we're in. This is the structure of the international system today. And what you see is we have two conflict dyads today, whereas we had one conflict dyad in the old Cold War, U.S.-Soviet Union, and now we have two, U.S.-China, U.S.-Russia. And of course, in the unipolar moment, we had zero. For the, for the younger people in the audience, for those of you who were born and grew up in the unipolar moment, right, you didn't experience the Cold War. This is a fundamental change that's taking place in the world that you live in. You've gone from a world where there was zero security competition among great powers because there was only one, to one in which there's security competition of an intense sort between the United States and Russia and the United States and China. So that's my structural argument. That sets it up. Now, as I said to you, what I want to do is I want to drop down and I'm going to start by talking about the U.S.-Russia competition and the war in Ukraine. And then I'll go to China. Now, the conventional wisdom, as you know, is that Vladimir Putin started the war in Ukraine. The conventional wisdom in the West which you hear nonstop, is that Putin is an imperialist, that he was bent on either creating a greater Russia or maybe recreating the Soviet Union, and that Ukraine was the first country that he wanted to conquer and incorporate into that greater Russia. And when he was done with Ukraine, he would move on to other countries. He was an imperialist at heart. He had an imperialist impulse wired into him. And the war in Ukraine, according to this story, was an unprovoked war. We had nothing to do with it. It was unprovoked. My argument is there is no evidence. And I want to emphasize this zero evidence to support that argument. There is no evidence that he was interested in creating a greater Russia. There is no evidence that he thought that was feasible. There is no evidence that that was what he intended to do a year ago tomorrow when he invaded Ukraine. There is no evidence he was interested in conquering Ukraine and incorporating it in to a greater Russia. To take this a step further, he invaded with 190,000 troops at the most. I don't believe 
he invaded with 190,000 troops, but that's the high end number people use, so I use it. There is no way you could conquer a country as big as Ukraine with 190,000 troops. I like to say that when the, when the Germans, when the Wehrmacht went into Poland on September 1st, 1939, they went in with 1.5 million troops. And at the same time the Wehrmacht attacked from the West, the Red Army was going to come in from the East. They still needed 1.5 million troops. 190,000 troops to conquer a country the size of Ukraine, not going to happen. And it's no accident that the Russians did not even come close to conquering half of Ukraine, did not even attempt to conquer half of Ukraine, because they didn't have enough troops. And furthermore, as I said to you, there is no evidence that that was Putin's goal. There is no evidence that he wanted to conquer all of Ukraine, and there's no evidence that he wanted to conquer any other countries. This is a story that we invented in the West so that we could blame him for the war. We could say it was an unprovoked war. My view is that the real story is that the West has been trying since 2008 to turn Ukraine into a Western bulwark on Russia's border. That strategy has three elements. One is to incorporate Ukraine into NATO, and that's the most important element. The second is to incorporate Ukraine into the European Union. The third is to foster an orange revolution or a democratic revolution in Ukraine and turn it into a liberal democracy that is pro-Western. See, what we want to do here is we want to make Ukraine a pro-Western bulwark on Russia's border. It was in April 2008, April 2008, very important date, at the NATO summit in Bucharest, Bucharest, Romania, where NATO issued a declaration that Ukraine and Georgia would become part of NATO. The Russians made it unequivocally clear. In fact, Putin was then at the Bucharest summit, and he made it perfectly clear there and then that this was not going to happen. It was not going to happen. NATO had gotten away with expansion in 1999. That's when Poland, the Czech Republic, and Hungary was brought in. NATO got away with expansion in 2004. That's when the Baltic states, Romania, Bulgaria, Slovenia, a handful of others were brought in. 2004. 2008, Putin said Ukraine and Georgia are not becoming part of NATO. Putin made it unequivocally, unequivocally clear then and he has made it unequivocally clear on numerous occasions since then that this is an existential threat to Russia. This is viewed as a threat that cannot be tolerated. He has made it clear that he would not let it happen, that he would wreck Ukraine before he would let it happen. The historical record is unequivocally clear on this one. What did we do? Well, first of all, you want to think about Georgia. In April 2008, as I told you, NATO said Georgia and Ukraine would become part of NATO. You realize on August 2008, August 2008, April 2008, August 2008, there was a war between Russia and Georgia over this very issue. Then, in 2014, as we continued to push eastward to bring Ukraine into these institutions and make it a Western bulwark, that's when the crisis broke out in Ukraine. It was on February 22nd, 2014. That's when the crisis first broke out. That's when Putin took the Crimean Peninsula. And what did we do? We doubled down. After the 2014 crisis, after Putin took Ukraine, we continued to push. We armed 
We trained the Ukrainians. You want to know why the Ukrainians have done so well on the battlefield against the Russians? And they've done really well. It's quite impressive, isn't it, how well the Ukrainians have done? That's due in good part to the fact that we trained them and we armed them. And as we were doing that from 2014 up to last February, Putin was telling us this is unacceptable. This is unacceptable. So when he invaded last year, February 24th, this was not unprovoked. This was provoked. He had made it perfectly clear on numerous occasions that this was unacceptable. This was, from the Russian point of view, a war of self-defense. They were not going to tolerate that. And by the way, I assume almost everybody here in the audience is American. And as you know, we Americans have the Monroe Doctrine. And the Monroe Doctrine says that no great power is allowed to put military forces in the Western Hemisphere. There are many of us in the audience, me included, who are old enough to remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. You remember what happened when the Soviets put missiles in Cuba? We said, this is unacceptable. You've got to get those missiles out. This is our backyard. You don't put military forces in our backyard. Well, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. If we don't want missiles or troops from a foreign country in our backyard, you should understand why the Russians don't want NATO, a military alliance that was a mortal enemy during the Cold War, on their border. Remember the Korean War? Some of you probably remember it. 1950, we crossed the 38th parallel in Korea. Korean War was going very well for us. We crossed the 38th parallel. We started heading towards the Yalu River. The Yalu River was the China North Korea border. The Chinese said, you better get back on the other side of the 38th parallel, because if you get up near the border with China, we're coming in. We ignored them. The Chinese sent huge numbers of troops across the Yalu River. And from 1950 to 1953, the United States did not fight the North Koreans in the Korean War, we fought the Chinese. And it's because we crossed the 38th parallel and we started moving up towards their, towards their border. This is what happens in great power politics. This is what happens when you get into somebody's sphere of influence, somebody's backyard, and you threaten them. This was a provoked attack. That's what caused this. Now, the question you have to ask yourself is where are we today? Well, first of all, the Russians view this as an existential threat. Right? This is an existential threat. What you're talking about when you listen to Americans talk about how to deal with this problem, listen to President Biden, you listen to the Secretary of Defense, you listen to the Secretary of State. They're talking about defeating the Russians in Ukraine. Defeating the Russians in Ukraine. They're talking about regime change in Russia they're talking about strangling the Russian economy with sanctions. This is a great power with thousands of nuclear weapons aimed at us that views us bringing Ukraine into NATO as an existential threat. That alone they view as an existential threat. What do you think they're going to view a threat that involves defeating their troops on the battlefield strangling their economy and affecting regime change. You don't think they're going to think about using those nuclear weapons? You don't think they're going to think about using those nuclear weapons? You're dead wrong. I'd be willing to bet a lot of money that if we start rolling them back in Ukraine, they'll turn to nuclear weapons very quickly. I'd bet a lot of money on that. Okay. It's an existential threat. What about the Americans? Well, we're now in a situation, if you listen to President Biden speak, where we basically view a Russian victory as an existential threat. The Ukrainians, for sure, view a Russian victory as an existential threat. I mean, this is their country. They've lost all this territory. They want that territory back. It's perfectly understandable. And the Americans, of course, want to defeat the Russians. President Biden has said the Russians can't win. Well, you know, if the Russians can't win, that means they have to lose. And if the Russians say they can't lose, they have to win, that means we have to lose. You think about this situation? 
President Biden has basically described Russia as an existential threat to the West. He sees this very much in ideological terms. Good versus evil. Of course, we're the good guys. They're evil. They cannot be allowed to win. So you have a situation here where you have two great powers, the United States and Russia. They're locked in a war in Ukraine. And both of them basically view the other side as an existential threat. And both of them are committed to winning. I want you to tell me how this one ends happily. Right? People ask me all the time, how does this one end happily? I, I can't tell you. I don't, I don't see how this one ends. Right? A meaningful peace treaty? What's a meaningful peace treaty going to look like? You think the Russians are going to give all this territory back to Ukraine and let Ukraine become part of NATO? I don't think that's happening. The Russians, as you've noticed, are committed. They're committed to turning Ukraine into a dysfunctional rump state. That's what's going on here. The Russians say, all right, you're going to try and bring Ukraine into NATO. We see what you're doing. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to turn it into a dysfunctional rump state. Why is it going to be a rump state? Because they're going to cleave off a huge slice of territory in eastern and southern Ukraine. They've already done a lot of that, and they'll do more. And furthermore, it's going to be dysfunctional because they're wrecking the Ukrainian economy. Just absolutely stunning what's happening to Ukraine. It's horrible. The Russians are not going to stop. They're not going to give all that territory back and go back to the status quo ante. It's not going to happen, right? And you think the Ukrainians and the Americans are going to be happy with the Russians cleaving off a huge chunk of Ukrainian territory and turning Ukraine into a dysfunctional state? That'll be a defeat for the United States of America. It'll be a defeat for Joe Biden. It'll make it almost impossible for him to get reelected in 2024. Right? So he's not going to want to quit. The Russians are not going to want to quit. So I don't think you're ever going to get Ever is too strong a word. I don't think in the foreseeable future you're going to get a meaningful peace agreement here where we put this one to bed. I think you're going to get a frozen conflict. You're going to have poisonous relations between the Russians and the Europeans, between the Russians and the Americans. Again, the Russians see this as an existential threat. We, they have... The, Putin and his lieutenants have made it unequivocally clear. They think we are out to wreck Russia and knock it out of the ranks of the great powers. You know how great powers react when they're presented with those kind of threats? This is what, I don't know what you know about the Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. Most people think the Japanese policymakers who made that decision were irrational. There's a whole literature that makes it very clear, and I've recently looked at this case for a book I've written. The Japanese policymakers who planned the attack at Pearl Harbor on December 7th were remarkably sophisticated and rational. They understood full well what they were doing. They thought that it was highly likely that Japan would lose. They had no illusions. Yet they attacked anyway. Why did they attack? They attacked because they were desperate. The United States was strangling them economically. Japan was highly dependent on imports of oil and scrap iron from the United States. Japan does not have many natural resources. Franklin D. Roosevelt was strangling the Japanese economy, and he would not let up. And they felt that the end result is they were going to be knocked out of the ranks of the great powers. They were facing an existential threat from Washington, and they were desperate. So they leapt off the cliff, and they attacked at Pearl Harbor. This is basically what you're thinking you should be thinking about with the Russians. This is an existential threat. They see their survival at stake, and we keep pushing, and we keep pushing. So again, tell me what the happy ending is here. And the Ukrainians, for completely understandable reasons, don't want the Russians to end up walking away with any of their territory. And furthermore, the Russians want a neutral Ukraine, and Ukraine wants to be part of NATO. So we are in real trouble. Let's shift gears and go to a situation in East Asia that is 
that is at least as dangerous, if not more dangerous. What's going on in East Asia? Why all of a sudden this rivalry between China and the United States? After all, from roughly 1980 up until about 2017, we got along very well. Certainly in the 1990s and the first 15 or so years of the 2000s, excellent relations between the United States and China. And then something happened. Well, what happened is that China became a great power. And China has a lot of people and it has had truly impressive economic growth. So it now has the economic wherewithal to build a very powerful military. And what the Chinese are interested in doing is they're trying to imitate the United States. And you say, what does he mean by that? The United States dominates the Western Hemisphere. The United States is a regional hegemon. We are the only great power in the Western Hemisphere. The Chinese are interested in being a regional hegemon in Asia. The Chinese, number one, want to be by far the most powerful state in Asia, number one. And number two, the Chinese want to get the Americans out of Asia. Remember the Monroe Doctrine? We don't want China, Imperial Japan, Imperial Germany, Nazi Germany. We don't want any of those countries in the Western Hemisphere. The Chinese don't want us in East Asia. From their point of view, it makes perfect sense. If I'm playing China's hand, I want to be the most powerful state in Asia by far, and I want the Americans far away. You know what happens when you're weak in international politics? The Chinese call it the century of national humiliation. From late 1840s to the late 1940s, the Chinese were taken advantage of by the other great powers. It's the century of national humiliation. The Chinese have no intention of ever being weak again. What about the Russians? You all remember when the Soviet Union broke apart? You all remember what... Uh, terrible state Russia was in under Boris Yeltsin in the 90s and even in the early 2000s after Putin took over. And what happened when Russia was weak? We shoved NATO expansion down their throat in 1999. We shoved it down their throat in 2004. And we thought we could shove it down their throat again after 2008. That's what happens when you're weak in international politics. The Chinese are fully aware of this. They want to be really powerful. And I don't blame them one bit. If I were driving the train in Beijing, I'd be aiming to be the most powerful state in Asia by far. And I'd be doing everything I could to weaken the United States. And when I think about developing high-end technologies, which are enormously important for generating wealth and generating military power, I'd have a lot of satisfaction knowing that I'm out there on the cutting edge when it comes to developing technologies like AI, uh, 5G, quantum computing, and so forth and so on. The Chinese are serious competitors, right? That's the Chinese side of the story. What about the Americans, right? What about the Americans? The story is very simple here. We do not tolerate peer competitors, right? We are a regional hegemon in the Western Hemisphere. We are the only regional hegemon in modern history. And we have no intention of allowing China to be a regional hegemon. If you look at the 20th century, the 20th century, there are four cases of other countries that attempted to become regional hegemons. Imperial Germany, Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, and the Soviet Union. We played a key role in putting all four of those countries on the scrap heap of history. We do not tolerate peer competitors. And we will go to great lengths to prevent China from dominating Asia. You can see the balancing coalition forming already. You can see us trying to get other countries on our side of the ledger working to contain China. You can see us trying to slow down Chinese economic growth, especially when it comes to computer chips. Right? We want to make sure that we remain the dominant economic power on the planet because that will help us remain the dominant military power. And we want to contain the Chinese. This is why I said to you before, if we were strategically smart, we'd be working to have the Russians with us against the Chinese instead of foolishly driving 
the Russians into the arms of the Chinese. But this is what's happening. You have this security competition setting in between China and the United States. And it bears marked resemblance to what you saw uh, with regard to Imperial Germany, Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, and the Soviet Union. These were all potential regional hegemons. That's the nature of the competition. Let's talk a little bit more about that competition. There are basically three big flashpoints where you could have a conflict. Uh, one is the South China Sea, uh, and there are a number of small islands in that body of water that are points of conflict. It's really control of the South China Sea that matters. Second flashpoint is Taiwan. And then the third flashpoint is the East China Sea and some tiny islands that the Japanese now control in the East China Sea that the Chinese say belong to them. I want to talk about Taiwan because Taiwan is the most dangerous flashpoint by far. Uh, Taiwan is like Ukraine. Uh, why is that the case? It's very important to understand that from China's point of view, Taiwan is important strategically for this competition, but more importantly, it is sacred territory. It, this is nationalism. This is Chinese nationalism. I have never met a single Chinese person who isn't completely committed to China recovering Taiwan and making it part of the mainland. This is truly important for the Chinese. And the last thing they want is to see Taiwan become more and more independent. Now, here's the problem. The problem is from the American point of view, we can't let the Chinese have Taiwan. And as we put together this balancing coalition, this alliance structure in Asia to contain China, you know, we have very good relations with Japan. We have very good relations with South Korea. We have very good relations with Australia. We have very good relations with the Philippines, right? We have to have good relations with Taiwan as well. We basically have to treat them like an independent country. The Wall Street Journal just had a piece that says we're quadrupling the number of American troops in Taiwan. This is going to drive the Chinese crazy. Again, Taiwan is sacred territory for them. They want it back. And here are the Americans forming a closer and closer alliance with Taiwan. Now, why are we doing that? For two reasons. One is we cannot allow, we cannot afford to allow, uh, we cannot afford to, to sort of uh, cut Taiwan loose because of what it would say to our other allies in Asia. If the Americans demonstrate that they're not willing to defend Taiwan, what's that going to say to the Japanese? What's that going to say to the South Koreans or the Filipinos, right? Now that we're committed to defending Taiwan, there's no turning around because of the ripple effects on our other alliances. That's one. Second is, if you're interested in bottling up, bottling up the Chinese Navy, and the Chinese Air Force inside the first island chain. You're preventing, you're interested in preventing the Chinese Navy and Air Force from projecting power out into the open waters east of China. You have to control Taiwan. Taiwan is strategically important, right? So we have good strategic reasons for hanging on to Taiwan, for forming closer relations with Taiwan, and at the same time, this is anathema to China. This is what makes Taiwan so dangerous. Now, I want to make one final point to you and then wrap up. And I'm going to explain to you why a war over Taiwan is more likely. I'm not arguing that it's likely. I'm not saying we are going to have a war over Taiwan. I want to make the argument that it's more likely than a war between the United States and the Soviet Union was during the Cold War. And here's the reason. During the Cold War, the principal focal point of the competition between the United States and the Soviet Union was in Central Europe. It was the inter-German border. 
It's where the Warsaw Pact and NATO were. On both sides of the inter-German border, you had thousands of nuclear weapons and you had massive armies and massive amounts of tactical aircraft. And when we ran war games, war games during the Cold War, it was very hard to get a war started in Central Europe because the people who were playing the war game understood that we would probably all end up getting incinerated. Anytime you take two massive armies armed to the teeth with thousands of nuclear weapons and you crash them into each other, the potential for nuclear escalation is quite significant. And you'll get vaporized. So who wants to do that? So in a very important way, the fact that a possible war in Central Europe during the Cold War would have been so horrendous made it extremely unlikely. Understand that logic? Now, let's go to Taiwan. Taiwan is a small island out in the middle of the water. It's much easier to imagine Chinese amphibious forces and American and Taiwanese and Japanese and Australian ground forces and air forces fighting over Taiwan. It's thinkable. War in Central Europe during the Cold War was almost unthinkable. So the fact that a war over Taiwan would be much less destructive makes it much more likely. Furthermore, use of nuclear weapons. It's much easier to imagine using nuclear weapons over Taiwan than it was using nuclear weapons in the Cold War. Again, that's not to say that would happen. But if the Chinese are losing that war, or the Americans are losing that war, it's over Taiwan, it's out in the ocean. I don't know. You can imagine nuclear weapons being used. That's why it's so dangerous. And by the way, once you get a war going between the United States and China, I want you to tell me how you're going to end that one. It's a lot like Ukraine. How are you going to end that? I want to go back to Ukraine with another point. Just keep this in mind. During the Cold War, if NATO and the Warsaw Pact crashed into each other, you would have two nuclear armed adversaries engaged in a battle. In Ukraine today, if the Russians are losing on the battlefield, right? The Russians are losing in Ukraine. Let's assume that happens. The Russians can use nuclear weapons inside Ukraine without having to fear nuclear retaliation because Ukraine doesn't have nuclear weapons. One of the reasons it, it's likely that the Russians would use nuclear weapons if they were losing in Ukraine is because they don't have to fear American nuclear retaliation. It's not like the Cold War where you're crashing into American forces armed with nuclear weapons. You're attacking Ukraine. And Macron has made it clear, and I'm sure Biden would follow suit, right? We're not going to use nuclear weapons if the Russians use nuclear weapons in Ukraine. We're not going to defend Ukraine with our own nuclear weapons because then we'd be in a general thermonuclear war. So you can see, you can see how one can tell plausible stories about how nuclear weapons are used in Ukraine if the Russians are losing, or if the Americans come in and then it turns into an American-Russian war in Ukraine. Think about that. Think about an American-Russian war in Ukraine. Then you've got two great powers armed to the teeth with thousands of nuclear weapons, right? And then go back out to East Asia to the Taiwan scenario. Ken, I'm not arguing it's likely that you're gonna have a war, but you know, you can tell a story a plausible story about how you get a war over Taiwan, and you can tell a plausible story about how nuclear weapons are used. So what's my bottom line here? My bottom line is, during the first Cold War, we had one conflict dyad. During the new Cold War, we have two conflict dyads, US, Russia, US, China. Back then it was just US, Soviet Union. And furthermore, as I've tried to emphasize 
both of those conflict dyads we face today, U.S., Russia over Ukraine, and U.S., China, mainly over Taiwan, are more dangerous than the U.S.-Soviet competition. And then my final point to you, which I won't elaborate on, is this situation only gets worse with the passage of time because there are no good solutions to either the conflict in Ukraine or the conflict in East Asia between the United States and China. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mearsheimer. As anticipated, I think you've uh, given our audience a lot of food for thought, and I imagine, oh, I see we've already got people lining up to ask questions. Um, before we uh, turn to audience questions, we have one question um, from the live stream already. And, uh, and I have a question, but I might hold that just in case we get to a lull. So I'll start with our live streamer question, which comes from John Keane, who is a UMKC graduate with a degree in political science, emphasis in Russian and Eurasian studies. And he asks, just as the uh, USSR, the Soviet Union, collapsed internally into multiple states, what is the likelihood of Russia collapsing internally into multiple states also? Uh, I'm not an expert on Russian domestic politics. Uh, so you want to take what I say with a grain of salt. But my sense is that the chances are very small. Uh, I think that Putin is in firm control. And I think there is little evidence uh, that... Uh, the, there are centrifugal forces at play now that are likely to cause him great worry about his country coming apart at the seams the way the Soviet Union did in December 1991. You just don't see the centrifugal forces. I also think that war accentuates nationalism. Almost everybody says that nationalism has been a huge force multiplier for Ukraine. One of the reasons that the Ukrainians have fought so well is that this sense of Ukrainian nationalism has suffused the society and people are deeply committed to their nation state. Well, nationalism is alive and well in the Russian case, and you can rest assured that the Russian elites will play the nationalism card. And nationalism serves as a form of glue. It works against those centrifugal forces that might be there. So I think given the war, and given the fact that that accentuates nationalism, which is a glue, and given the fact that Putin and his lieutenants have a repressive state apparatus that they can use to keep things intact tells me that it's extremely unlikely that this will be a problem. Okay, thank you. Now, I again, I see we've got people lined up at both microphones. Uh, why don't we start over here on this side and we'll just alternate back and forth. Yeah, I went to a presentation on Tuesday night with the some gentlemen from the War College uh, at the library. They spoke of Crimea as being historically shifted back and forth between Ukraine and the Soviet Union, and it was used as a bargaining chip and also a, a, a symbol of goodwill as it went back and forth historically since 1900. And with the recent uh, annexation of, of Crimea, isn't that a sign that the West really isn't all bent out of shape over uh, the Soviet Union and didn't doesn't see this as an ex existential, neither do the Ukrainians see this as an ex existential uh, conflict, nor does the United States, because in 2014 that all happened and we don't see any of this, whereas the move toward uh, Kiev is a much, I mean, a much bigger deal. That's my first question. And the second question is, could we unpack the, the issue if we took NATO off the table? Because 
don't the Hungarian, I mean, don't the Ukrainians really want EU entry? Wouldn't that, if we disassociated those two propositions, wouldn't that get us get us all out of this this mess that we we built? And I'll jump in here as well and, and just ask everybody, uh, we'll try to keep it to uh, one question so that everybody has a chance to, to ask. Yeah, just with regard to your second question, uh, I, I think that before the war, you could have prevented this from happening, could have prevented the war from happening by taking NATO off the table, right? Uh, I think at this point in time, that won't be enough. Uh, and I don't think at this point in time, the West can just take NATO uh, off the table as an issue. Uh, so I, I think the difference before the war and now is quite profound. With regard to your first question about Crimea, I, I don't want to talk too long on it. Uh, I think that uh, the Ukrainians have to say that they want all of their territory back, including Crimea. And there's some of them who do. Uh, I think that most Ukrainians, if pushed by the West, would accept a deal where they got everything back except the Crimea. I think the Americans would be willing to cut a deal where the Ukrainians got everything back but the Crimea, because the population in Crimea is significantly pro-Russian, right? Lots of Russians in Crimea. So I think that one, uh, the Ukrainians would go along with, not all Ukrainians. Uh, with regard to what's happened to Ukraine over time, that's a complicated issue, but I would just note that in 19, I believe it was 1954, when Crimea was part of the Soviet Union, and Ukraine and Russia were two of the republics in the Soviet Union, Khrushchev took... Crimea away from the Russian Republic yes, right. and gave it to the Ukrainian Republic, yes. all inside the context of the Soviet Union. And uh, so you can tell the story about how it's sort of bounced back and forth. And of course, there have been a lot of different uh, switches involving other areas of the former Soviet Union as well. Yes, um, Mark Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, called his counterpart in China a few years back and said, we don't want to fight you because uh, it was looked like they might get into it. Uh, my question is, the, the Russian military, the Chinese military, and the American military, is, is there any kind of a relationship between the armed forces of the three countries that maybe, I'm not saying a military can override the civilian. We don't want to see that. But if if the Chinese guy was willing to take Millie's call and say, okay, I, I understand what you're saying, and I believe you, could maybe people who actually have to fight wars, maybe there's, could there be some sort of a back channel communication between our military leaders of China, Russia, yeah. and the United States? Is that is that remotely possible? Yeah. There's no question that there is a back channel uh, communication between military leaders in the United States and China, and I believe even the United States and Russia. Uh, but the fact is that military leaders don't have much influence on whether or not states fight wars. It's basically political leaders who make those decisions, and the military goes along. This is not to say that the military can't have an input, but the military in, in these three countries uh, does not hold much sway. Uh, I think General Milley's views appear to be at odds at times with the political leaders, both in the Trump administration and now in the Biden administration. But in both cases, Milley has been of secondary importance in formulating policy. It's been either the president either President Trump or, or President Biden. And I think in the Russian case, I'm sure you would agree, Vladimir Putin is in charge, right? And in the Chinese case, Xi Jinping is in charge. So I think it's the politicians uh, who matter here the most. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, how much can be said uh, that the Russian Chinese are communist 
in their perspective is in the Marxist paradigm and that their strategy is to get inside the capitalist system and manipulate that system for their benefits. Or I, I wish that were true. God, I wish that were true. Don't you wish that Chinese, China was a communist country again? Uh, then they'd be economically bankrupt and we wouldn't have to worry about them as a strategic competitor. I don't the think problem with the Chinese is that they're first order capitalists. Well, Gorbachev, Joe Gorbachev was a communist, okay? And the communist and Chinese call themselves communists. They can call themselves whatever they want, but the fact is that they're capitalists par excellence. China is a country that's dominated by state capitalism. Right? They abandoned communism as an economic system in large part because it was bankrupt. Uh, the Soviet Union fell apart because communism was bankrupt as an economic system. Well, let me ask you this question then. How much is there, how much is there intellectuals, Marxist? Not None? very much. You know, I'm going to be honest Their with you. Their intellectuals are not Marxist? No, not most of them. The, most of the, I started going to China in 2004. OK, and I went numerous times and I I talked to all sorts of Chinese scholars, Chinese intellectuals, Chinese policymakers, huge numbers. The subject of communism never came up. It's truly amazing. I was hoping they had a Marxist theory of international politics that we could contrast with my realist theory of international politics. Instead, what I discovered is almost all of the Chinese were realists. So when I would go back to China, time after time, I would usually start my talks by saying, it's good to be back among my people. That's what I'd say when I was in China. These weren't Marxists, these were realists. I, I... Here in the United States, now that China's our enemy, we're saying it's a communist country because that means it's a threat. Again, if it were a communist country, we'd be in great shape. The problem is they play the capitalism game at least as good as we do, if not better. I think I think I think I gave you I watched a lecture that you were giving in a com, one of the com, Eastern Bloc countries, in which you were telling them how they thought in their Marxist thinking. I'm not sure about that, but uh, let's, uh, we should, let's we should go to the next to this right. young woman here. Uh, my main question is, I'm sort of concerned about the way you're speaking, just sort of, for, first of all, I don't believe in sort of like positive analysis in terms of like truly existing, in terms of only being able to describe the facts of the situation. I think almost all analysis has some suggestion about how it should be should be interpreted by the players involved. So uh, when you're talking about like NATO expanded outwards, are we, and like how US is like pushing Russia by trying to force Ukraine into NATO, um, are you worried about like taking away agency from the lesser players in this conflict? Or I, I'm just concerned about how yeah. your rhetoric treats basically anyone except the governments of what you call great powers. Yeah, yeah. Just two points. One is just on your initial comments. Uh, I want to be clear that I'm not standing up here and saying I have the truth. I have all the objective facts and just listen to me and follow me. It's not the way the world works, right? Uh, I'm giving you my interpretation as best I can. Uh, I'm basing it on facts and logic, but that's not to say that I am right and any of you who disagree with me are wrong. And that's actually why I love these Q&A sessions. And I love it when people uh, like this gentleman over here just is challenging me because it forces you to refine your thinking and sometimes change your thinking. So I just want to be clear. I think you and I uh, are in agreement on that basic point. Uh, with regard to your question, uh, your, your, your substantive, substantive question, excuse me, this is a very, very important issue that uh, people address to me all the time. And aren't you saying that countries like Ukraine don't have any agency, right? That uh, they're just pawns in the game. Uh, I think there's no question that the Ukrainians have agency. 
And by the way, I think that President Zelensky and President Biden worked together during the course of 2021, early 2022, to make this war happen. I believe Zelensky had agency. And I believe Zelensky could have gone to great lengths to slow down the move toward war, but he didn't. So I believe Zelensky has agency. I don't believe that smaller powers have that much agency. As you would expect from a realist like me, I think that the great powers basically call the shots. But that's not to deny your point that smaller powers do have some agency. But the point I would make to you is, I just think that it was not in Ukraine's interest to try to become a part of NATO. I think that if you're Ukraine and you live next door to a gorilla, you have got to be very careful. It's, if, it's like if you're Cuba, right? If you're Cuba and you live next to the United States, you just can't have an independent foreign policy and do whatever you want. Because if you do that, the United States will come in and crush you like a bug. The United States is one of the most ruthless great powers in modern history. You've got to be very careful that you don't cross the United States. And my point about Russia is if you're Ukraine or you're Georgia, you've got to be very careful if you're not already in NATO. And they were not already in NATO. And the Russians said they would wreck Ukraine if it tried to get into NATO. I think given all that, it was in Ukraine's interest to exercise the agency that it had to work against the American effort to bring them into, into NATO. Thank you. Yes, my name is Antien Zayarniuk. I'm a student at University of Kansas. Uh, so you said that there is no evidence that Putin invaded Ukraine for any other reason than the NATO expansion, the, the fact that Ukraine can join NATO. And I wanted to ask you about like several facts, like for example, uh, Finland and Sweden, they, they applied for NATO right after right after the war started and like it wasn't in any way an existential threat for Russia, at least from the, from like they didn't do anything and it wasn't even part of their like narrative inside the state. Another thing is that like the way Russia conducts war in Ukraine, I think like the, the way all the atrocities happen and the way the official narrative of both Putin and all the media, like the way they deny the existence of like Ukrainian nation as a whole and the way they conduct war in Ukraine, it doesn't really fit for me with this narrative that the only reason they attacked Ukraine was to prevent it from joining NATO. Because I think if they did that, it wouldn't be in their interest to make Ukraine like such an enemy for Russia. Also like the fact that they are now uh, like doing the referendums on the Ukrainian territories and like just joining, uh, up, like adding these territories to the territory of Russia, like why are they doing that as well if, if the initial reason was only to to stop them from joining the NATO. And I think also that like from the, after the Bucharest summer, uh, summit, I'm sorry, like everyone had understood that there is no, there, there is no, uh, in the nearest future, there is no real threat of Ukraine joining NATO because no one in reality really considered Ukraine as a NATO member, I think both in the West and in Russia as well. There, there was like this ma membership plan, but Ukraine wasn't fulfilling it at all, and no one really, like, on the, when negotiations were happening between Ukrainian leaders and the Western ones, it wasn't really on the table at all. Okay. The, the problem with his question is he's got about four or five terrific questions embedded in one question, and my memory is not as good as it used to be, given that I'm yes. not as young as he is. Uh, but I'll try and answer as many of his points as I can remember. Uh, just on Finland and Sweden, there's no question that they want to join NATO. Uh, and there's no question that Finland and Sweden all of a sudden fear Russia now in ways that they didn't appear to fear Russia in the 1990s and early 2000s. But that doesn't mean that Russia was bent on conquering them or conquering Ukraine. My point is, in the West, in Finland and Sweden are basically part of the West. We have this conventional wisdom, this story that Putin is an imperialist and he's bent on conquering countries in Eastern Europe. 
and recreating a greater Russia or recreating the Soviet Union. And the Finns and Swedes are fearful of that and they want to join NATO. I think their fear is unjustified because it's based on a story that is basically a fairy tale. Now, with regard to Putin's goals, it is very important to understand that before the war broke out, Putin did everything he could to settle the civil war in the Donbass. It was a civil war taking place in the Donbass involving all Ukrainians, but Ukrainians who spoke Russians or Russian or identified as ethnic Russians, right? Versus Ukrainians who didn't identify as ethnic Russians and didn't speak Russians. So you had the civil war taking place in the Donbass. Vladimir Putin went to enormous lengths to settle that war with the Minsk agreements, right? He was not interested in conquering the Donbass. He wanted to settle the conflict there. Then the war broke out last February. And after the war got started, Putin then decided that he was going to take the two oblasts in the Donbass. There's two oblasts, two regions that make up the Donbass, and two other regions as well, and incorporate them into Russia. So his goals have expanded his territorial goals. And this is all part of making Ukraine a dysfunctional rump state. Remember the point that I made in my talk. Putin's view is if he cannot get a neutral Ukraine, he will turn it into a dysfunctional rump state. And he's taking territory. Right? There's no question he's taking territory. My point to you, though, is he was not planning to take that territory before the war broke out. And this is an escalation of aims. My argument is his aims will not, not escalate to the point where he tries to conquer all of Ukraine. That is a bridge too far, and I believe he understands that. So I don't believe that Ukraine is going to disappear. And then my final point to you is I don't believe there's any evidence that he did not believe in Ukrainian nationalism. He did not believe that there is a Ukrainian nation state and that he wanted to disappear Ukraine. That is not true. What he was willing to live with a Ukrainian state, by the way, that included Crimea. He was willing to live with that. But what happened was that NATO expansion and the effort to make Ukraine a Western bulwark on Russia's border led to this war. And now you have a situation where you're going to have a dysfunctional rump state. Had there been no war, in my opinion, Ukraine would be intact today. But like prior prior to war, when in uh, I think summer or autumn he released the like his historical uh, essay on the Ukrainian nation, where he basically denies. I, I, know, I know the essay very well, and it. The essay, Putin wrote an essay uh, on July 12th, 2021. And uh, in this essay, which people who share this gentleman's perspective always point to as evidence that Putin was uh, interested in uh, doing away with Ukraine and making it part of a greater, greater Russia. If you read that, he says no such thing. He says no such thing. There's no, I believe there is no evidence in there that he was interested in conquering Ukraine. It's perfectly clear, in my opinion, that he understands the power of Ukrainian nationalism from that document. And he says at the very end of that document, this is the July 12, 2021 essay that he wrote, he says the future of Ukraine is up to the Ukrainian people, right? And for all of you who have any doubts about what I'm saying, I would strongly suggest that you go home you Google that document, and then you spend an hour just reading it carefully. And I believe you'll find no evidence in there that he was interested in conquering uh, Ukraine and incorporating it into a greater Russia. Okay, let's move over to this side. As you mentioned before, uh, there are a few points of friction between the US and Russia at Georgia and Ukraine, between the US and China, 
uh, with Taiwan, South China Sea. Uh, what yeah. points of friction exist between China and Russia? And do you see those flaring up over the course of the next 20 years or so? Well, I don't see any real problems between China and Russia as long as we have our gun sights on both of them. You, most of you, I'm sure, have been reading the newspapers where it now appears Xi Jinping is going to go to Moscow to meet Putin, and the two of them are going to uh, play kissy face together, right? I mean, what we're doing is we're driving the two of them together. You all understand, from China's point of view, it is very important that Russia not lose. So the Chinese will help the Russians. And if, God forbid, we get into a war with the Chinese over Taiwan, the Russians have a deep-seated interest in helping China make sure that it doesn't lose to us. We are a mortal enemy of both China and Russia, and that has driven the two of them together. Now, you say, where's the potential for conflict? I think in a place like the stands, you know, Kazakhstan, South, what we used to call Central Asia, I think you could imagine trouble there. You can imagine trouble over the border in Siberia. Is this likely in either case? No, it's possible. When I used to talk to the Russians well before the Ukraine crisis broke out in 2014, and even shortly after it broke out, when I go to Russia, uh, most of the elites I talked to would say, we don't understand why you're picking a fight with us. We're your natural enemies. Historically, we had bad relations with the Chinese. We share a border with the Chinese, right? Uh, you all remember the Sino-Soviet split, right? Why aren't you taking advantage of that historical uh, disagreement between the two countries? But we didn't do that. We went in the opposite direction. Thank you. So I found your, uh, when you were talking about China and Taiwan and that relationship interesting because you talked about the ripple effects that could happen if, um, well, if we uh, Taiwan were to be lost to China. Now, the thing, the, the interesting thing to me about China is that it's been surrounded by allies of the United States since the end of World War II, basically around that time. So why hasn't China made a move on Taiwan? Well, I, oh, if, oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, that's it. So if it's so easy for, like you said, it's, it's easier um, to fight in Taiwan than it is to fight in Ukraine, why haven't they made a move on it? And this, like, especially since it's been such a long time, uh, I think since the, the Chinese civil war that they had, and they've always had their eyes on Taiwan. So why, why have they not made a move on it is my question. Yeah, yeah this is a great question. Uh, just, I, I just want to frame it simply just so I can answer it head on. The question is, why haven't the Chinese militarily moved against Taiwan? Uh, if I gave you the impression that it's reasonably easy, I was wrong. At this point in time, it would be one well of a difficult task. First of all, it would be an amphibious operation. In other words, the Chinese would have to come across a big body of water called the Taiwan Strait, and land on the beaches of Taiwan. And many of you have seen Saving Private Ryan, uh, which dealt with Omaha Beach, you know, the 1st Infantry Division landing at Omaha Beach. Amphibious operations are wickedly difficult because you can't bring a lot of heavy equipment with you. You can't bring artillery. You can't bring tanks. Basically, you have infantrymen in landing craft, right? and you have some tactical air up on top if you control the skies. But the Chinese in all likelihood will not control the skies over Taiwan. They won't be able to bring in artillery and they won't be able to bring in uh, tanks. And we will have submarines in the Taiwan state Straits, right? We will have all sorts of aircraft in the sky and the Taiwanese military, the American military, the Japanese military and the Australian military, they'll be the key players will be there to meet them on the beaches in all likelihood. So from that perspective, it's really difficult. Second point I'd make to you is, you know, the last time that China fought a war 
was 1979. As you all know, the most warlike state on the planet is the United States of America. Our military is like a cocked gun. Lots of experience, ready to go at a moment's notice, right? The United States is an incredibly militaristic country. China hasn't fought a war since 1979. If you're the Chinese and you look at how the Russians performed in Ukraine, right? You start saying to yourself, can I be highly confident that my army, Navy, and Air Force is going to perform, you know, in really impressive ways? I think the answer is no, right? You don't have a lot of experience, right? You haven't fought a war in a long time. And then to go back to my first point to you, you're launching an amphibious operation across the Taiwan Straits in the face of American military power. Japanese military power, Australian military power, and Taiwanese military power. This is not the time to do it. If you're smart, if you're China, what you do, and this was Deng Xiaoping's strategy, you play for time. You just continue to grow economically, and you get to the point where you're economically much more powerful relative to the United States than you are today, so that you're in a position to build more formidable military forces. But even then, it'll be really difficult to conquer Taiwan. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I'm John. So my question is about... Could you just talk a little louder, please? Is this good? <laughs> That's fine, yeah. Lovely. Uh, so my question is about the possibility of a future conflict with Taiwan. So... You've identified that the war in Ukraine was caused by what was perceived as an existential threat to the Russian state by the Russian state. And that's caused something that resembles a scorched earth campaign almost to wreck Ukraine as a country to ensure that any admission into NATO or integration into the West is as costly as possible. In the case of Taiwan, because Taiwan has existed for a longer period of time in conjunction with the People's Republic of China, and also arguably doesn't pose as significant as a of a risk as Ukrainian integration into NATO. Do you think that, how do you think a war regarding Taiwan would shape? What do you think the intensity would look like? Do you think that the lack of uh, existential threat uh, would push up the time frame for when a war would begin? Do you think that would cause it to be uh, happen sooner? You know. Yeah. Let me make two sets of points in, in response to your excellent question. Uh, first of all, as he was hinting at, in the case of Taiwan, we've been there for a long time. We, we've been there. I mean, the Chinese Civil War ended in 1949, and the nationalists lost, the communists won, the nationalists retreated to Taiwan. And then when the Korean War broke out on June 25th, 1950, the next year, that's when we decided that we were going to defend Taiwan. So we, in very important ways, have been joined at the hip with the Taiwanese since 1950. We have been in East Asia, in China's face, since the end of World War II, okay? And that, that's very important. And it's very different than the situation with Ukraine. With Ukraine, we were steadily marching eastward. You see what I'm saying? 99, the first tranche of expansion. 2004, 2008, 2014, 2022, right? But in the Taiwan case, there's no marching. We're right there. So it's just very important to understand that. Uh, now, in terms of what a conflict would look like, and what I'm going to say argues to some extent against the point that I made in the formal lecture. In the formal lecture, I said a war over Taiwan would be a war out in, over an island out in the water, okay? He asked me what exactly would a war look like over Taiwan? Well, you want to remember that Taiwan, even though there's that body of water there, is quite close to the Chinese mainland. You could eat, for those of you who haven't been to Taiwan, you can easily see the Chinese mainland. In fact, if you're a good swimmer, you could probably swim from China 
to Taiwan. What that tells you is the Chinese, to get to your question about what a war would look like, the Chinese are going to have huge numbers of military assets on the Chinese mainland right near Taiwan. And if a war breaks out over Taiwan, are we going to target those Chinese military assets on the Chinese mainland? I bet we are. And then you begin to run into the risk of escalation. And let me just take this a step further, and I won't get into it in any greater detail, but his question <laughs> raises all sorts of issues. One of the problems we face with these Chinese military forces that are right near Taiwan on the Chinese mainland is that their nuclear forces and their conventional forces are intertwined in all sorts of ways. The command and control systems for their nuclear forces and their conventional forces overlap in important ways. So if a war breaks out over Taiwan and we decide that we're not just going to restrict it to fighting out in the water, going back to my formal presentation, but we decide that we're going to whack, we're going to hammer those Chinese forces on the mainland, right? Not only are we attacking the Chinese mainland now, but we run the risk of reducing the capabilities of their nuclear forces. And then you run into what's called the inadvertent nuclear escalation problem. So even that one is a really tricky issue as well. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kai Ringenson. Uh, first of all, I, would, I appreciate your clear analysis and the explanation of the other side's perspective. Um, that helps always in a conflict to understand. I'm Swedish, that's my accent, and you already <laughs> commented on Sweden and Finland's application to NATO. So I'm just going to tell you a story about uh, when my family and I went to uh, Latvia and Lithuania last summer for my Swedish nephew's wedding to a Lithuanian girl. We spent a few days there and we met a lot of people. Uh, we went to the, uh, what they now call the KGB museum. This is the museum, this is the building where the KGB had their headquarters during the Soviet occupation of the Baltic States and Lithuania. It's a terrible, terrible place, but well worth a visit if you go there to understand what they were up against. And uh, we spoke to a lot of people during that wedding, of course, it was a big wedding. and. Uh, I would say that unanimously, all the Lithuanians said that if they had not joined NATO when they did early on, they would have been first. For sure, they would have been first. And um, uh, I think we need to remember that NATO is, is an open invitation to someone who would like to join. But it seems like you are really uh, saying that NATO is, or the United States is pushing, is overselling NATO to the uh, to the small states like the Baltic states and Sweden and Finland. By the way, Sweden had had wars with Russia for about 600 years, I think, many wars. Uh, Sweden and Finland were united until, I think, 1809, when Russia occupied uh, Sweden then and took Finland from Sweden. Uh, it was a part of the, um, uh, the Tsarist Empire uh, until the First World War, when it became a nation, then Russia, or the Soviet Union then, attacked Finland twice during the Second World War when they were alone. When, when the Soviets were fighting with the uh, Allies, was, were a part of the Allies fighting the, the Nazi Germany, Finland, they were alone. And Sweden supported Finland as much as we could, but of course, uh, eventually were overwhelmed. And then of course, Finlandization was uh, a concept that was born after that. And maybe you want to comment on that and why Ukraine did not well, one question, do you really think that uh, the Baltic states did not, when they joined NATO, was not demand-driven, that it was pushed upon them? And secondly, do you think that a Finlandization of, if I say that term correctly, would be an option, should have been an option for Ukraine? Look, I, I fully understand why the Baltic states wanted to join NATO. Uh, I have no doubt about that. Right? I have no doubt why many Ukrainians wanted to join NATO. It makes perfect sense. Uh, 
I know a great deal about European history. I've done most of the research for a book on the German killing machine in World War II. I know an enormous amount about the German killing machine. And the Germans, as you know, did a lot of killing in Eastern Europe, to put it mildly, yeah. as did the Soviets, right? I know what life was like under the Soviet Union in places like Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, Poland. I have no, no illusions there. By the way, you might not know this, but I was probably the only person in the West, the only person in the West, who argued in 1993 that Ukraine should not give up its nuclear weapons because the Russians might come knocking someday. I want you to remember that. I argued that Ukraine should not give up its nuclear weapons because the Russians might come knocking someday. So I, I have no illusions here. I'm a realist par excellence. Uh, but you want to understand that, first of all, the Baltic states were able to get into NATO. They got in on the second tranche. They got away with it. They have an Article 5 guarantee now. They're protected. They're really happy about that. I don't blame them one bit. They got in. With regard to Ukraine, that was going to be the third big tranche. Putin made it clear that was not going to happen. right? So the Ukrainian situation is just fundamentally different than the case of the Baltic states. And you say that NATO is an open door alliance. Anybody if you qualify, who, if you qualify, you are allowed to apply. Well, I don't believe that it's in our interest just to let anybody in who wants to get in. You may think it should be an open door alliance. No, 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 I, no, I don't no. think so. I don't believe that. I don't believe it was in our interest to wreck Ukraine. My argument, as you know, is that we are principally responsible for Ukraine being wrecked. And it's because we believed in this principle of an open door. And the Russians didn't believe in that principle of an open door. So I don't believe that just because another country wants to be in NATO, that we have to allow it to be in NATO because it's qualified. I think this is a prescription for disaster. And that's what you have here. So I my argument is that in the Ukrainian case, Right? It would have made good sense not to push NATO eastward. Just one final point to you. These people that you met in Lithuania said that had they not been in NATO, they would have been the first victims. I would say to them, what's the evidence of that? What's the evidence that Putin had his gun sights on the Baltic state? There is zero evidence that that's the case. They believe that, of course, just like the Finns and the Swedes believe that the Russian boogeyman is coming after them. But this is because we invent these stories in the West to portray us as the good guys and them as the bad guys, right? Vladimir Putin becomes the second coming of Adolf Hitler. Uh, anybody who's in favor of diplomacy with Russia to end this horrible war is accused of being an appeaser. This is like 1938 Munich. This is the world that we live in. We have all of this rhetoric in the West that bears little resemblance to reality that's designed to uh, portray our adversary, in this case, as uh, the font of all evil. Well, thank you. Good evening, Doctor. Um, I wonder if you would expound on the impact of the shift from a unipolar world structure, world power structure, to a multipolar structure on the shift of the nuclear policy review released under Mr. Obama's administration to those that were released under Mr. Trump and Mr. Biden's administration um, and the impact that this has had with our relationship between uh, the U.S., the Russia, and China. Well, during the unipolar moment when we were the only great power, uh, the Chinese had a remarkably small nuclear deterrent and they were content with that remarkably small nuclear deterrent. I have some friends who believe that we had a splendid first strike capability against China's nuclear capability because it was so small. And the Russian nuclear deterrent during the unipolar moment actually weakened because the country was, for most of that period, in so much trouble. So the Obama administration, before that the George W. Bush administration, and before that the Clinton administration, 
did not have to worry much about nuclear modernization or maintaining our nuclear edge. Donald Trump becomes president in January 2017. We are in a multipolar world, or we're moving out of unipolarity into a multipolar world. And of course, then President Biden replaces President Trump in January 2021, and he's clearly in a multipolar world. Those guys, Trump and Biden, are deeply interested in modernizing our nuclear forces so that we maintain a nuclear edge over the Chinese, who, as you have surely noticed, are building up their nuclear forces, and the Russians, who are building up their nuclear forces. So we're now going to have a serious arms race at the strategic nuclear level. And you all noticed the other day when Putin gave his speech that he said that he was suspending Russian participation in the last standing arms control agreement, New START, which means that the Russians are basically free uh, to build nuclear weapons as they see fit, in my opinion. And of course, we'll do the same thing. The Chinese want nothing to do with the nuclear arms control agreement because they think that what we're trying to do by corralling them into a nuclear arms control agreement is preventing them from catching up with us. So we're going to see uh, a serious nuclear arms race. And remember, in the Cold War, it was us and the Soviets. We're talking about a serious nuclear arms race between the United States, China, and Russia. And if you think it was difficult getting arms control agreements when there were just two players, just think about how difficult it's going to be to get arms control agreements when you have three players. So we're in big trouble. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, thank, thank you very much for showing up here. So earlier, uh, you said that you had, an, had it in mind that the United States and Russia possibly could have joined together in alliance against a rising China. Um, but, you know, that, that, of course, did not happen. Um, have you ever gone to think, possibly, that the reason why is more ideological within the United States? The people who do talk about democracy, our values, that sort of thing, that because Russia as a country isn't about those sorts of things, and they have a more autocratic system, that's why the United States, even though it would have technically made more sense um, from a geopolitical standpoint to make alliance with Russia against China, that the reason why we didn't was because of it, that internal ideological construct within the United States. Basically, Joe Biden isn't really lying to us when he acts like the Russians are, in fact, the font of all evil. Like, that's actually a common thing they think in Washington. I, I, I actually agree with him completely. Uh, it's a very smart point. And let me just unpack it a bit, okay? Be, because the, he, he's sort of getting at the question of, all right, John says that the United States and China, sh excuse me, the United States and Russia should be aligned against China, and they're not. And then the question is, why not? And I really did not address that issue. And he, of course, did. But, and I agree with him, but let me just embellish it a bit more. I believe that our Ukraine policy was set in stone during the unipolar moment when we were not thinking in realist terms. We were thinking, to use his rhetoric, in idealist terms. Right. This is the era of what I call liberal hegemony. We were thinking about spreading liberal democracy, spreading capitalism, spreading our terrific Western European institutions eastward, right, in a very liberal fashion. Right. This is why somebody like Michael McFall, who is a huge supporter of the uh, of the Ukrainians and was U.S. ambassador to Russia from uh, 2012 to 2014 can say that he told Putin on numerous occasions that uh, the United States was a benign hegemon and that we were not moving NATO eastward 
to contain the Soviet Union. Right? You realize we were not moving NATO eastward to, to contain Russia. Sorry. We were not moving NATO eastward to contain Russia. That only became an issue after 2014. So you're absolutely right that between 2008 and 2014, it was not realpolitik that was driving NATO expansion, as hard as this might be to believe. We did not see the Russians as a threat until 2014. The conventional wisdom today, the story that Putin was an imperialist, he was bent on conquering Europe, that he had his gun sights on the Baltic states, as this gentleman said before. This story didn't exist until February 22nd, 2014. Putin became the devil incarnate overnight because when the crisis broke out on February 22nd, 2014, we had to blame him. Couldn't admit that it might be our fault, but it was our fault. But to go back to your point, it was not realpolitik. It was the liberal ideas that underpinned our foreign policy during the unipolar moment that set the train in motion and we were unable to get off the train, right? And the gentleman from Sweden over here, uh, um, his question was an excellent question. I'm not picking on him, but I think his perspective was very much NATO's perspective to include the American perspective during the unipolar moment that NATO was, NATO had an open door policy, right? That we were interested in bringing states in and helping turn them into democracies and getting them hooked on capitalism and so forth and so on. But my argument is that that world has now gone away. We're in, we're in a real politique world. All right. Thank you, Professor Mearsheimer. And thank you to our audience members. <laughs>